take her away. This is uh, Professor Tom Pereira. Tom is, um, if you're if you're from New England, you see Tom at, at uh, Near Fest and at a bunch of our forums around uh, our shows around here talking about old telegraph keys and spy radios and CIA bugs and and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, he's also at Dayton too. But uh, now you're gonna have the opportunity to see uh, the master at work with some of this stuff. And uh, I tell you, not too many people know about spy radios. Uh, it's it's really really weird because you know spies back in the world war ii years they had to kind of like phone home and you couldn't make a phone call that was being listened to so they had these portable little transceivers with tubes in them or something like that (laughs) they kind of a work of art so tom take us away tell us about all this stuff thank you i want to thank barry for a fantastic presentation that was uh uh, it, you can always tell a teacher uh, when he's given a presentation because we're all used to trying to keep kids awake through the talk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to step you back 80 years from now from the cutting edge stuff that we've just been hearing about all the way back to World War II. And along the way, I'm going to stop off uh, at uh, my uh, shack. Let's uh, share a screen here. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see, that's not what I want, is it? No. Nope. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, there we are. Okay. Share screen, sorry. Uh, there. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm going to talk about. Um, Uh, spy radios and the Enigma and CIA bugs. And along the way, I just wanted to stop off at my uh, second year as a ham radio operator. And this is, this is what my shack looked like uh, after one year. Uh, I lived in New York City at the very end of World War II. And uh, the surplus was amazing. So you could go downtown, buy all this great stuff. And you can tell from the stuff here that I was a already a pack rat collector. If you look way over on the right, you'll see a World War II walkie-talkie. And that was really my first World War II radio, but hundreds of World War II radios after that came along. And I'm gonna show you some of them. But let's start out at the beginning and look at what happens when a, uh, a country is invaded. And when uh, countries invaded such as Germany, uh, the first thing that happens is the population splits up into three different uh, categories. The citizens either do nothing, the middle category here, and that's the majority of them. Some of them figure, oh boy, these guys have just invaded us are really powerful. I better collaborate with them. They become traitors and spies. And part of the trouble of running radios in, uh, in World War II is that uh, you always have the possibility that your neighbor is spying on you. Uh, the third group is the resistance, and these are the patriots. These are people who are involved in active fighting and spying, but they have to get information from the allies that they're trying to support and send information to the allies. Uh, And that requires radio equipment or did in those days. And um, most of the uh, resistance fighters are not trained radio operators. So a number of British trained clandestine spy radio operators had to be trained up and parachuted into an occupied country. And uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, First of all, we look at the situation in the country where people needed to figure out what was happening during the war. And in order to do that, they had to build and hide receivers. Because if you were caught with any kind of radio receiver, you were dead. People would be shot on site if they had these things. So they hid receivers typically in suitcases like this, but they dreamed up some amazing ways to hide them. Look at the old iron at the top here and the radio built inside the iron, a telephone directory with a, tele- with a radio inside it, even the leg of a piece of furniture with a radio built inside it. It was desperate business and you could not afford to be caught. 
on the left, the phonograph, on the right, the radio inside the phonograph. All these techniques for doing this. Here's an old box camera with a radio inside it, and even a thermos bottle with a radio built inside it. Here's one of the most extraordinary artifacts from World War II, uh, a person who built a radio inside a dental uh, device and put that in their mouth. Absolutely amazing stuff. The most popular and frequently used of the <clears throat> receivers was called the Sweetheart Radio Receiver, made by the thousands by the English and parachuted to resistance fighters all over Europe. And these things were used to be very plentiful. You could buy them on Radio Row after the war for about a dollar. And one just sold um, at an auction for $8,000. So uh, they have gone up in price rather dramatically. And even they had to be hidden sometimes inside a clock and sometimes in other places. Uh, spies uh, used these radios to listen in to the Allies and learn about what was going on during the war. Uh, the Germans also supplied their people with radios. It's called the Volksempfänger, like the Volkswagen, the people's car. The Volksempfänger was the people's radio receiver. And the ad on the left says, you can hear the Fuhrer with your Volksempfänger. The problem with the folks and Fanger was that you better darn well listen only to Hitler on this thing, because if you were caught tuning to any other station, you would be subject to arrest, possible, possibly being shot. And there were all these pictures of happy families listening to the happy Fuhrer telling everybody how good the world was going to be. But every folks and Fanger came with this little tag that said basically, do not listen to any other radio stations under penalty of death. Uh, very interesting little device, and they have become quite popular collector's items too. Um, the clandestine spy radio operators who were primarily um, parachuted into England, were trained in England. Here's a, a picture of an operator being trained to use a radio in a suitcase here. The operators were fitted with appropriate disguise clothing from a huge archive of clothing in England. Uh, the, the radios were packed into very well shock protected packing, such as you see over here on the right. And the spies were loaded aboard aircraft to be airdropped at night into Europe, not a simple process. Um, and when they got there, they would have to set up their radios. And of course, we all know one of the major jobs of setting up a radio is to put up an antenna. Uh, trees were probably the most typical place to put them, but many, many dozens, hundreds of spies put antennas up or dropped one down through a chimney. You couldn't see the wire if it was in a chimney. It radiated fairly well, and uh, it was pretty hard to detect it. The operators would set up in various ways, highly trained with these suitcase radios, quite fascinating radios, and operate these to communicate back. Codenamed Paulette, who parachuted into Normandy before the invasion uh, at age 23. And she would send half hour coded reports and then run away, far away, knowing that she'd be found by direction finding teams within one and a half hours. And here she is with one of her radios operating it in Europe. And uh, these radios often could be disassembled and fit into common household devices like this um, vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner could uh, accept the radio and be rather hard for the Germans to detect it in there. Uh, some radio operators had to use um, external power supplies, which occasionally were vehicle batteries, but quite often they took a vehicle generator and hooked it up to a chain and a bicycle set of bicycle um, uh, footrests and uh, generated electricity. And this is a typical 
a station that you would see inside a barn with one person generating electricity and in front of uh, the operator you see the suitcase radio. The information had to come to the operators from somewhere and often it was smuggled inside a loaf of spoiled bread so that it would be less likely to be examined by the Germans who were looking for these people. One of the great problems with spy radios is that darn things are really, really, really heavy. And the reason for that is they all have a huge transformer in them that's used to change whatever voltage is coming in into an appropriate voltage for the radio. And many of them will work on six volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, 110 volts, and 220 volts. So that transformer made them very heavy. And so it's a little hard uh, to look innocent carrying a radio that weighs about 40 pounds. And you can sort of see how heavy this radio is for this lady carrying it up a flight of steps. If you happen to have a bicycle, uh, you'd be much more likely <coughs> to uh, be able to carry it around without looking too suspicious. The radio, of course, is on the back of this bicycle. And the spies, again, would set up in the woods, put up antennas, and very often they had to arm themselves with uh, machine guns. You see two uh, machine gun equipped operators here. We see another operator at the radio. Here's another classic look at people. There's a hand crank generator in the background, uh, the radio in the foreground. And again, they're hoping not to be detected. Um, the radio sets that were used in World War II came in various flavors and shapes and sizes, wonderfully described in this huge volume, volume four of um, Mulesty's book, The Wire Wireless for the Ra uh, Warrior. And this book is, a, a, quite expensive, but very worthwhile. I'll just take you on a tour of some of these wonderful old radios that are described in the book and occasionally found at various shows. This is a British uh, spy radio, one of several that were built inside a suitcase. Uh, this is a British set called the Paraset because it was designed to be dropped by parachute and was a little more rugged. The tubes were not kept in the sockets, for instance, and it was able to handle pretty severe shock when it was dropped. Uh, this is the most classic, I think, of all the British World War II spy radios. It's called the B-2, and it was uh, actually designed by a ham, G-3-E-U-R. The uh, uh, transmitter is the area in the center in the back of the set. The receiver's in the front with a nice dial here with a uh, vernier tuning that allows you to tune in signals very well. And then the whole right side of the set is taken up with this multi-voltage power supply. Telegraph was the typical mode of operation. Seldom were the spy uh, radios equipped with microphones. <clears throat> and this little uh, telegraph key is a referred to as a spy key, and they have become quite collectible over the years. Uh, moving a little bit further forward in time, this is the PRC-1 um, radio, which again is built into a suitcase, but a little bit more modern. And this is a PRC-5 radio. And you'll see the suitcase that it is built into looks very small and typical. Uh, it could be either a typewriter case or a small suitcase for clothing. And when you open it up, the set is inside there. And uh, I'm actually going to demonstrate my PRC-5 and put it on the air at the end of this talk. But you'll notice that inside the lid of the PRC-5 is a schematic diagram as though every operator who was parachuted in to Europe uh, knew how to read a schematic and fix the radio. And the truth of the matter is virtually all of them actually did. Really neat. The schematic for a moment and just see how familiar it looks. The bottom half of the schematic is the transmitter. The upper half of the schematic is the receiver. Transmitter starts out over here on the left with a crystal oscillator, 6V6 crystal oscillator, and that is fed into a 6L6 power amplifier, which is fed into a tank circuit. And if you look right here, you could see a little light bulb, and they actually use that light bulb to help, you help them tune for maximum RF out into the, into the antenna. 
On the right, we see the power supply multi-winding transformer and a rectifier tube. And looking at the receiver, we see a very typical arrangement for the receiver. We have a power amplifier on the left, a couple of IF stages in the middle here, it used a 455 KC IF, a beat frequency oscillator to make uh, the uh, uh, CW signals audible, and that's produced by a local oscillator. So very straightforward circuit and uh, pretty easy to fix actually, except if something went wrong inside the IF cans up here. Here's another radio set called an SST-1, a little bit later, uh, sort of at the very end of World War II. And this radio transmitter was made small enough so it could fit inside a piece of French bread. So uh, it had to be quite small. As you can see, it's a one-tube rig, uh, and the components are wired on the back side of it. And I'm, again, I'm going to show you one of these and I'm, uh, at the end of the talk, but I'm not going to uh, transmit with it. <clears throat> Here's an SST-1 in operation. And here is an SST-1 along with an SSR-1 receiver and the power pack on the right, all been built into a relatively innocent looking suitcase. And again, if a woman was carrying this suitcase, Germans would very seldom bother to stop them. And in the same way, radios were often uh, hidden into baby carriages because they were less likely to be detected. Much more recently, we get into the GRC series radios. And here is a GRC 109. You can see the telegraph key is actually part of the transmitter in the lower right here. Michael Crustle, Mr. Mike, has put together a wonderful little chart for us that identifies the um, nomenclature of these various radios. Uh, in World War II, SCR stood for Set Complete Radio, and that would be a radio transmitter receiver and typically a power supply. A BC is a basic component. In late in the war, the two radios we just looked at the, are the PRC series, portable radio communications. And still later uh, during the Cold War, we had TRC for practical radio communications, GRC ground radio, VRC vehicular radio, and SING cars, single channel ground and airborne radio systems. Now it's helpful to have those designations in mind, especially if you're out shopping around trying to find a World War II radio. Uh, one of my favorite uh, radios, World War II era is on the right here. It's the BC-611 Handy Talkie, the first handheld radio uh, to be designed. And on the left, we see the absolute latest cutting edge of handheld radios. This is a radio made by Harris. You'll see it being deployed all over all of the war zones as we speak. And uh, the presidential security uses these radios. The radio actually has a built-in encoder that's very much like an Enigma. So it's a very, very uh, compact and complex radio capable of uh, very secure communications. Uh, in the history of portable communication, secret communications. We have some really weird things. Here's a back-worn scuba radio, and you would surface with this thing in the middle of some body of water and transmit and receive. And here's one of the weirdest of all. It's a puppy dog radio. The uh, radio is mounted on the dog, and the, uh, the owner of the dog can talk to the radio, or maybe it's the dog can talk to the owner. I never did figure out which way it went on this, but uh, another little artifact from World War II uh, ideas uh, about how to communicate. Um, here's the inside of a real World War II spy headquarters in Norway, Bergen, Norway. And their job was to spy on the Germans and send radio messages back to the allies. A uh, radio transmitter with a big variac here controlling its power output. And in this little cabinet up here is a bomb. And that bomb would go off if anybody, unauthorized person, entered this room and blow it up 
and blow up the person and anybody else consisted of TNT up in the cabinet. And in order to keep the bomb from going off, you had to open this door in a very, very specific way. You see the motor on here. The motor had to actually activate and pull this latch out of the door in order to open it. If you tried to break down the door, it would uh, send an electrical signal to the bomb and the bomb would go off. And uh, here is how you actually deactivated uh, the bomb and opened the door. You had to use a piece of wire and put it onto one of the nails in the door. And this isn't really a door you think of as a door. If you look at it from the outside, it's just a piece of a wall. But if you put your little metal jumper cable on one nail and then on the other nail, the uh, latch for the door would retract, the door would open, and you could enter without being blown up. Some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, direction finding devices were always being used to try and catch these guys. Here's a typical German direction finding van with the antenna on top and various other kinds of direction finding vehicles. And here is the inside of the van. You had to hand rotate a direction finding loop in order to find the location of the person who was transmitting. And uh, they also had direction finding loops mounted on Feisler Storch, which is a very slow fly flying, wonderful observation plane that was used flying over various locations to try and locate where operators were being, were operating from. Uh, an operator would typically operate in a given location and then quickly leave the location. And the Germans would sometimes turn off city blocks in a given town to try and catch the operator by finding out when they cut the power to what block would it stop the operator from transmitting. Once they had the general location of a spy radio operator in a given city, they would then resort to a handheld direction finding device to try and pinpoint the location more accurately. And this is a direction finder built into a suitcase with the headset as a readout, you would tune it for a null in the signal and uh, various controls on the top. Uh, here we see a Gestapo agent, a German operator uh, for the Gestapo. Uh, he has a hidden spy radio detector inside his coat. Now, he looks fairly innocent here, but if you do a flasher job with him, you suddenly find that when he opens his coat, you can see an incredibly complex radio receiver, wide band radio receiver on which he could receive radio operators. So you go from this to this and uh, he doesn't look very suspicious, but when he operates this radio, you can see this wire going up. It goes up to a loop antenna that is sewn into the lining of his coat. And the guy will walk along the street looking quite innocent like this and occasionally look at his wristwatch. And the wristwatch is actually a signal strength meter. And he uses his wristwatch to tell him when his coat is pointing uh, at the direction of the spy radio. So he walks along, turning a little bit and watching his wristwatch until he finds a null. And that gives him the location of the spy radio. Uh, the uh, way of countering that, of course, was to reduce the amount of time that you as a spy radio operator spent transmitting. And that was done by various ways of sending very, very fast CW, sort of like what we just saw in the last talk, bursts of information that were so fast that you couldn't possibly send them by hand and they were uh, difficult to receive, if not impossible to receive by ear. And for spy operators who didn't know the Morse code or weren't fast enough, this little device was used to send extremely fast Morse messages. If you take this pen and you run it down this little slot here, you can see that it's going to send dit da, the letter for A. And the next slot is dash, dot, 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 B, and so on. So you would just make up your message and slide the slider down these various slots quickly and send the message as rapidly as possible to prevent the um, 
uh, Germans or the uh, uh, radio direction finders from locating your spy radio. Of course, there were also enciphered messages. Various techniques were used for uh, making messages secret and hiding them uh, with secret inks. Uh, typically, spies did not use Enigma machines. Enigma machines are heavy and complex, and uh, they had to be free to operate. So uh, these are hand uh, encrypting techniques. And here is a, a typical message sent by a spy and hidden inside a hollowed out walnut shell. So there was always this uh, problem of how do you hide your messages so that the enemy doesn't find them? Where do you leave them? You leave them in dead drops for other people to pick up. The spies, however, were all coordinated by the use of Enigma machines. And the Enigma machines would uh, uh, talk from various spy controllers to other spy controllers. And one of the amazing things was that the allies, of course, were able to intercept the Enigma signals and decode the Enigma signals with the help of the Polish uh, mathematicians who were the first to really discover how to decode Enigma uh, signals, despite the uh, claims that the British did at first. The Poles really taught them how to do it. And they would decode these messages, and the messages actually revealed the locations of the spy radio operators. And so the British would know exactly where the spy radio operators were located, and they'd go to them like this guy, and they would uh, catch them with their spy radio and say, listen, uh, we're going to kill you. You're a spy. But if you cooperate with us and you continue sending secret messages back to Germany, uh, we won't kill you. We'll just make you into a double agent. And this guy said, well, given that choice, I guess I'll, I'll choose to cooperate with the British. And he sent hundreds of fake messages back to his controllers in Germany. And again, he was caught initially by the Enigma machine. And it is believed that virtually every spy that parachuted into England was located due to the fact that they um, were discussed on Enigma communications. And here's another guy who was set up in New York City with a ham radio station. You see the Hallicrafter speaker over here, an old Hallicrafter radio and so on. And this guy had built a pretty nice station, got batteries down here. Uh, he's got his mascot over on the right. And he was sending messages back to Germany, but he was uh, picked up in New York City um, by um, a direction finding team that located him. He was located up in the top of this apartment building. That was his, his studio apartment up there, easy access to the roof and to antennas. And here he is, and uh, he was simply executed. He didn't want to uh, cooperate with the allies. At the end of the war, all of the radios that had been taken away from the occupied people were given back to them. And here's a, a lineup of people getting their, their old radios back and uh, they were now able to listen to any radio stations they wanted. So that's a fairly quick summary. I'm going fairly fast because I want to leave time for a demonstration at the end here. The second thing I want to talk about is um, the Cold War and CIA bugs. The, techniques that the CIA used for listening in on uh, various conversations. And this is part of a talk that was developed by two people in um, the Netherlands, Paul Rovers and Mark Simons, and they, they worked together with me on uh, Enigma Communications. I'm going to talk about various techniques that the CIA used during the Cold War. And of course, one of the primary of these was hidden microphones, which would feed into tape recorders or which would operate with radio transmitters. Uh, here we see a necktie that looks very normal, but inside the necktie is a radio transmitter. We have the antenna here. Problem with all these kinds of radio transmitters is that they use batteries and they don't just keep on transmitting. Here's a CIA built bug inside a pen. And we see over on the left, the batteries, uh, the microphone is the next thing to the right. 
we have a few discrete component transistors here, and then the antenna is wound on a little coil at the end. And this is a CAT scan showing us the inside of this pen. From the outside, of course, it would look just like a normal pen. Here's a phone tap that was used by the Stasi, the uh, Russians, to listen into people's telephones. And what the uh, telephone repairmen go into the basement and say, we have to make a little adjustment to your phone line. We're going to put in this device that conditions the signal. And that's what this means, signal conditioning uh, device. But it's actually a phone tap using a couple of uh, capacitors that we see up here to isolate the phone line so uh, you can't tell that there's a tap in there and then uh, feeding the information to a hidden microphone. Uh, here's a typical KGB bug, very, very simple design. Uh, a little battery and uh, the microphone of this bug is actually a crystal earpiece. And uh, speaking into the microphone or whatever the microphone picks up, uh, acts as a frequency modulator directly on the frequency of the transmitter. So you have a free running oscillator and the microphone simply modulates the frequency of that oscillator and you get a nice little FM signal out of this tiny, tiny little box. But again, dependent on some kind of power supply. So it can't be just left somewhere. Here is IBM Selectric typewriter with a bug built inside it. And here's a little chart that shows a large number of various kinds of bugs. Each of them is fascinating to look at, uh, but I don't have time to talk about all of them at this point. So I'm gonna move on and talk about bug detecting. The Tesla MRP4 was used by many, many countries, the allies and many, many uh, uh, countries to detect the location of a uh, bug or a spy hidden transmitter in a given room. Very simple circuit. You can see it has two antennas, a small high band antenna, which is this little round circle here, larger low band antenna, still very high frequencies. And they feed into a simple diode. The diode feeds into an amplifier and the amplifier then feeds into an indicator, which you see on the front here, a meter, or into a speaker. So you can you carry this thing around and listen in and locate a bug just by walking around and picking the maximum signal. Here's a, a, a typical uh, spy bug locator in action. You can see the bulge in his coat from the MRP4. And if he does a flashing act on you, uh, all of a sudden you see his MRP4 spy bug detecting receiver on his chest here and a pair of earphones up in his ear. Uh, here's another bug detecting device. Uh, carried around by a sinister looking guy. And again, you turn this thing, you, as you turn it, uh, it changes the signal strength and you can home in on a bug using these kinds of detectors. One of the techniques, every time you develop a, a new device for making something secret, someone comes along and develops something better to hide it. And one of the techniques that was developed was jamming. Uh, the people who would be carrying on conversations in a room and didn't want to take a chance that a bug might be giving away what was going on would simply apply a strong jamming signal that would flood the room with a jamming um, uh, uh, signal and block out the ability of the bug to transmit. And in order to counter that, a differential bug detector receiver was used. A differential receiver is interesting because any signal that is detected simultaneously between two antennas is canceled out. Whereas any signal that comes into one antenna more strongly than the other antenna is amplified. So you move this thing around, you get a point where you cancel out the jamming signal, you're still able to pick up the signal from the bug. Very neat technique for unjamming. But there were still other techniques that were being developed. Here's one of the most amazing. It is a CIA bug bug. Indeed, it is the equivalent of a drone that has been made extremely tiny to look like and act like a, uh, uh, a tiny little uh, bug. The microphone is in the tail here. This thing flew around a room and picked up 
uh, conversations that were going on inside the room. One of the problems was it was a little noisy, so it wasn't real uh, efficient as a secret bug detector. But then the CIA got pretty smart, and in 2017, they said, hey, our uh, fake bug was pretty successful, but it made noise. How about we use a real bug? And sure enough, they took a, a little bug and they mounted an extremely small bug transmitter on the bug and had this dragonfly fly this little transmitter around. A little hard to uh, give instructions to a dragonfly as to where to go, but it was uh, something that was developed by the CIA in order to bug rooms and uh, detect what was going on in there. Now, the next question is what happens to these bugs if you put them in a room and the battery goes dead? Well, you're out of luck. And uh, it was very important for all people who use bugs to avoid that problem. And uh, the first example of this was the great seal of the United States carving that was given to the United States Embassy in Moscow as a gift. Uh, by the USSR when the United States refurbished their embassy in Moscow. And they put this thing up on the wall. And of course, you guessed it, yep, there's a little microphone inside this great seal. Notice that it was donated to the United States in 1945. It was not until 1952 that they found this bug and they were so embarrassed about that that it wasn't until eight years later that they revealed that they had found it. Okay, wow, that is impressive. And this bug uses no battery. It uses passive elements, no electronic parts and no batteries. How could that be? Let's take a look at it. It was a device with, yeah, an antenna on it. We saw that in the diagram there. And this device would take an RF signal that was sent into the antenna and it would then modulate that RF signal and rebroadcast it through the antenna. And it would modulate it by simply changing the capacitance of a microphone chamber. So this microphone chamber was picking up the sound and the changes in capacitance of the microphone chamber changed the frequency of re-radiation of an imposed signal coming into this mic and that could then be picked up. Uh, this was eventually improved upon. Uh, this is sort of the basic uh, pr process. And in 1955, uh, our CIA uh, developed a device called Easy Chair, and that was the same concept, but with a, an amplifier in here to amplify the signals picked up by the microphone and then modulate the signal of the microphone. And it did that by uh, rectifying the signal. You see this little diode in the antenna and using that rectified signal to power the amplifier, which picked up and amplified the mic signal. And the mic signal was then rebroadcast back through this antenna mechanism. Um, this Operation Easy Chair was used by the United States in 1958 to bug the Russian embassy in The Hague using the technique that we had learned from the Russians, actually, a, a modification of it. Uh, the idea was to be able to listen in to what was going on in this room in the Russian embassy. <clears throat> and that was done by uh, having a special desk uh, that was being built for the embassy. Uh, have an embedded device inside the leg of the desk. And here it is. It is the easy chair, same technique that we've seen. If the high level intense signal is imposed on this little antenna here, then the microphone up at the top picks up signals and the antenna rebroadcasts a frequency modulated um, I, uh, image of the audio that has been going on in the room. Um, another example of Operation Easy Chair was uh, an attempt to actually um, make another such device work in the Russian embassy. And the, uh, the allies are set up over here on the left in Zorbier, and there's 125 meters between them and the Russian embassy. And they're trying to pick up 
uh, audio signals from the Russian embassy. So they got to irradiate the Russian embassy with a very, very strong signal. And uh, here is the, um, the uh, signal generating house. Uh, the uh, antenna radiating signal is up a flight of stairs here and uh, out the window here. So we're talking about a very directional radio transmitter that is sending, sending um, a high, volt, high power RF signal to excite uh, the um, antenna in the Russian embassy. And there's the Russian embassy. And what we're actually doing then is sending this tremendously high power signal at the Russian embassy to get that uh, rod, that antenna vibrating uh, at radio frequency so that it can then be modulated and the re-vibration or re-radiation radiated back to a receiver. And you notice that the effective radiated power, the, the power level that is reaching the embassy at 10 kilowatts. And that you really don't want to spend a lot of time right in the middle and in front of a 10 kW signal. And that brings up the uh, the issue that we've been struggling with for a long time recently, and that is beginning uh, way back, uh, the uh, people in the CIA uh, who had been posted to Cuba and China began complaining of debilitating headaches and vertigo and nausea and memory loss and dizziness and tinnitus and other symptoms. And uh, at first the CIA just poo-pooed and said, well, you know, it's a different climate and so on and so forth. Uh, in the current issue of Science, uh, the journal Science, actually December 20th, uh, December 2020 issue of the journal Science Magazine, they reported that the National Academy of Sciences has concluded that pulsed high energy radio waves were responsible and probably caused those symptoms. And now you and probably they understand what that's all about. I'm gonna stop my formal presentation at this point, and I'm gonna move on and start showing you a demonstration of some actual spy radios. I'm gonna start out uh, with this uh, SST-1 and show you this device. This is the device that is designed to fit inside a loaf of bread. And as you can see, it's very, very small. Uh, classic spy radio. There's a place for uh, crystals to plug in here, your antenna tuning here, and a little light bulb over here, which tells you how your signal is doing. And if we take it apart and uh, look inside the device, we see that the radio transmitter is a one tube transmitter, fairly nicely made, not as com compact as we might make them nowadays, but in those days, it was really a dramatically small device. And uh, it was sort of state of the art at that point. And now I'm going to show you uh, the um, PRC5 and I'm gonna play spy at this point. And I hope you can all see that okay. Make sure that I take up your whole screen. And there's the suitcase radio over there. Uh, we see over here uh, the walkie talkie, which I talked about earlier. And uh, wonderful radio, really well built. Quick note about the walkie talkie they were so well designed that they could actually transmit and receive for several miles. But the military realized that the guys who were using them should not be overheard by the enemy. And so they purposely detuned these when they issued them to people in the field so they wouldn't give away any intelligence. And again, this radio, which is the state of the art latest radio being used by the uh, military and the government. Okay, so pretend you're now a spy and you've just gone into a location where you're gonna set up your radio and you've got your suitcase here and you're gonna open up the suitcase and uh, hopefully you don't need to look at the schematic diagram. You open the top of the suitcase and there is your telegraph key. And you take out your telegraph key and you put it down in front of the radio and you plug it in to the key jack on the radio. And then you take 
your earphones. I'm not going to use earphones for this. I'm going to use a loudspeaker so you can hear what's going on. And you plug in the earphones down here and uh, you turn the radio on and you turn it on uh, one of two positions. Uh, the center position there is receive. And when you move that to the right, you're in the transmit position. So receiver, you can hear, you can hear the receiver background noise is coming up. I'll turn down the volume. Let me take you on a little tour around the front of this radio first. Uh, we start out with the antenna connections that are up here, the uh, off receive transmit switch is here. The uh, final tank coil, transmitter tank coil is here. This little light up here tells you whether RF is getting out into your antenna. The crystal that determines the frequency that you're going to be operating on is over here. Uh, the uh, uh, oscillator coil uh, is here. And this uh, crystal oscillator can be tuned to two different frequencies, either the fundamental frequency of the crystal or the first harmonic. And that can be determined by the tuning of this oscillator coil. And the oscillator will take off on whatever frequency you choose. The headphone jack is down here. And the um, uh, switch that switches the meter between the um, oscillator and the power amplifier is there. Headphone jack down here. The BFO, beat frequency oscillator, that lets the audio uh, detected by the receiver become audible as a tone is down here. The receiver volume control is here. The really horrible, horrible part of this radio is the receiver tuning knob. I don't know how well you can see this, but this little knob right here is almost impossible to tune. And at my age, it's very impossible to tune with shaky hands, but the, the uh, tuning is very, very critical as you'll see in a moment. Over here is a band switch for the receiver, low, low band and high band. The, the radio covers uh, four megs to 15 megs and uh, nice broad coverage. And uh, uh, what I have up here is the switch to switch between 120 volts and 220 volts. So I'm now going to transmit a signal. I'll put it on transmit here. I have a light bulb over here. I'm gonna load the signal up into the light bulb and you'll be able to see the light bulb glow as I tune up the transmitter. And uh, I'm gonna start out I'll let you hear the transmitted signal on my shack receiver. You can hear a little chirp. Okay, we tune the oscillator. And we'll tune the and the antenna. And we'll listen to it. I didn't have the oscillator set right, I guess. Now that's the transmitting end, and that's easy for a spy to do. You can set up this radio and you can transmit very easily. Receiving is a nightmare, I will tell you. I'm going to transmit a signal on the same frequency with my shack transmitter, and I'm going to show you what it takes to tune it in on the radio. Let me get a little more audio here. Can you imagine a spy radio operator in some horrible position uh, trying to tune in a signal 
with a rig like this. I think you'll agree with me that uh, these guys deserve an amazing amount of credit if they're able to do that. Anyway, that's what it looks like if you are a spy operator and you're trying to operate one of these sets in the real situation. And I think I have a couple of minutes left to answer any questions. And I will be also at the um, uh, four o'clock get together to answer any questions and just to enjoy being with all you guys. Mitch, you have done the most incredible job with this meeting. We all appreciate it. So anybody with questions on mute and I'll try and get to you in the last three minutes or so. Absolutely outstanding presentation, Tom. Thank you. We got to get you to put yours on the air, Mike, and then we can communicate. Mike also has a PRC-5. Mr. Mike. I was thinking that, that uh, with a little bit of advanced planning, we could probably do that. The only problem, Mike, is this damned receiver is so touchy. It is. I can't believe they would do that to people because... Um, if you're not an experienced ham, you probably couldn't find that signal. It's it's so um, hard to tune. Tom, hey. I've got a I got a question for you. Sure, go ahead. Um, if it covers that much of a frequency coverage that uh, you said it does, how does the operator know where to transmit? Uh, given such a um, a wide range of frequencies that they can use, uh, how do they know what frequency they're on and know that they're in the right spot. It was all prearranged, sort of like Enigma decoding. You had to have that information, what frequency to listen on in advance. But the point I'm trying to make is even if you knew approximately what frequency you were wanted to listen to in 40 meters, say, it'd be just hell on wheels to tune that damn receiver so you could actually hear anything. Uh, transmitting, no problem. They tell you transmit on the crystal frequency. You're on that frequency, not going anywhere. Hope that answers your question, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? You all ready to be uh, spy radio operators? <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Go ahead. Hi, um, my dad was a dispatcher um, in World War II. He dispatched um, planes off of aircraft carriers. After he died, I found his um, discharge papers. It said he was in um, Air Pacific Air Fleet One, but then someone in the family said he was stationed in uh, Virginia. Is it possible, do you know, um, to transmit from Virginia out into the Pacific? It, it is possible. Uh, it is easy actually, and it could be done. The only thing is uh, during, if we're talking during the war, uh, ham radio was forbidden during the war. So no ham uh, transmissions or reception could have taken place. Yeah, I meant to say he was in the Navy. Um, he was a, a Lieutenant Ensign and um, so I just was curious about that, if he could have actually been stationed in Virginia and transmitting into the Pacific. I yes, it, it's certainly within the realm of what can be done on uh, ham radio. Okay. Since I have one more minute, I'll just show you the Enigma machine over here. I've been collecting and restoring Enigma machines for about 40 years, and they are quite fascinating. I'll do a talk on that some other time. And if, if we can get Mr. Mike to open up that doggone flea market over in Deerfield again, I'll have my enigmas out for everybody. October 15th and 16th. Yay. <laughs> I Thank you, wait. Tom. Thank you, Tom, for a great presentation. Thank you. Go ahead, Larry. Good. We got another minute. This was almost as good as going to a ham fest in person. <laughs> Larry, Larry, you, did you have a question? Unmute yourself. No question. I was just giving you a thumbs up. A great job. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah. Okay. Excellent work. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Bob.
Yeah, Tom, uh, you're the most uh, participants of any of the forums so far. Good job. Oh, wow. do I get a, a, a prize? I want a popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, invite well, you back. we'll send you one, but you probably end up with two sticks. <laughs> you get okay. a lifetime pass to your fest. We'll, we'll invite you back next year. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, Mitch. This is such an amazing, fun experience. I can't imagine how you put this thing together uh, so completely accurately and flawlessly so far. I haven't seen any glitches. I, I can't imagine it either. So <laughs> I'll lay down later and figure it out. Uh, it, this is great because I'm sitting here watching two forums at a time. If I'm, I'm